what's conditioned by the languages we speak, what is the pre-linguistic self of childhood or the thoughts of animals, and can we distinguish between language and the reality we describe, or does language create worlds? And here to discuss this fascinating and paradoxical question, we have a very distinguished panel. Um, so on my right, we have Hilary Lawson, who is the UK's preeminent non-realist philosopher, and his theory closure marks a post-Iridian return to metaphysics. We have Stephen Neal, who is the professor of philosophy and linguistics at City University, New York, and he is a world expert on Russell's theory of descriptions. And here we have Jana Teller, who is a Danish author and former UN conflict resolution expert, and Teller's seven books include the existential novel Nothing. So to start, I want to pose the significant opening question to our panelists. I'm going to start with Hilary Lawson, and the question is, can we have experience and thought outside of language? Most of us, I suppose, most of the time imagine language as being a sort of transparent medium. We uh, use language to describe the world, to get things that we want, and we largely think of it as being, being a tool to, to do that, and, and be, being, as I say, largely transparent. And for a long time, uh, philosophers treated language in much the same way until what uh, is sort of colloquially described as the linguistic turn when uh, philosophers came to think that language was central to the way that we uh, think and that the structure of language therefore told us something about the way that, the way that we were to understand our thought and perhaps also the world. But of course the key problem has been in relation to language becoming the central focus of philosophy has been to describe what is the relationship between language and reality, um, or language in the world. And it's going to be my contention uh, that this project has failed. Um, and we've been having a good go at it for something like 100 years, and I don't think there's any likelihood that it's going to be successful. So the question I therefore want to pose is, why is it further? Why has it proved so difficult to describe the relationship between language and the world? And my answer to that is because the aim of the project was to show how language was somehow hooked on or referred to or described the world. And I don't think we can do that because I don't think there's anything to hook on to. And that's not because, as some of my critics have argued, I am in some mad philosopher position of saying there's nothing out there, I think there's lots of stuff out there. But I don't think that what's out there comes readily divided into bits that we might somehow refer to with language. I think that language, and indeed more generally how we experience things, is to hold the world as things rather than to name the things that are already out there. So I think language is a tool which enables us to hold the world as something rather than to describe it. If we take any, any object around us, you know, a person or a table or you know, glass, or whatever, be it, say this table, we say, well, <coughs> what, what is it? I might say, well, you can hold it as a table, but you can hold it as lots of other things. You could hold it as some metal. You could hold it as a collection of molecules. Uh, you could hold it as a flat surface. I think you can hold that stuff there in an almost infinite number of ways. And all of those different ways of holding that bit of the world, I think, are uh, like metaphors for what to do with it. I don't think they're descriptions of something. I think what's going on is language enables us to hold the world as different things. And those different ways of holding the world enable us to intervene differently. And I don't think there's any fundamental connection between the way that we hold them and somehow how the world is ultimately. Uh, because language is just a way of holding the openness of the world. It's certainly true that uh, for a large part of the 20th century, language was put at the center of philosophy.
philosophy, and people thought that by dissolving problems about language, you were dissolving deep philosophical problems, or clarifying language <coughs> and able to clarify philosophical problems, at least. Um, but that changed, really, uh, in the 1980s. Um, and there's been a strong move towards thought as the central notion rather than language. And I'm definitely part of this camp myself as a program really initiated by Paul Grice, which took the notion of an intention, somebody having an intention, uh, to be the center of uh, all of our talk about meaning. Uh, so there's, a, there's an issue here about which comes first, thought or language, and people seem to be pretty divided on this. So people like Chomsky, who think that language evolved for some, just some random mutation, created recursion in the mind, and we got linguistic abilities eventually. And it's not the function of language to express thought. Uh, it's equally the function of language to articulate your own thought, sharpen your own thought, not necessarily communicate. There are other people, uh, uh, I think I'm one of them, who think that communication uh, with language is parasitic upon a very rich notion of thought already, a very higher order types of uh, thought are actually needed to even have something approximating a, a natural human language. So you need, um, what, you, what you desire is to change the mental states of other people when you speak. You desire to make them believe other things, intend to do other things, or in fact sometimes to do other things. And that's part of the reason that we communicate, to get reaction. So the whole idea that became very, uh, it's become, I think, very central, this, this, is, this bit's a little bit um, controversial, but the idea that thought precedes language, and this is, is now, I think, pretty widely held, but the idea that you, you produce types of behavior, linguistic behavior, or it may be non-linguistic behavior you're communicating with, and you intend other people to recognize that that's precisely what you're doing. It's in virtue of you intending these people to recognize that you intend them to come into some state as a result of you making these sounds or whatever, uh, that this type of system has the content it has. So thought precedes language. Language is um, a great uh, facilitator and a great sharpener. It's certainly true, we can't talk about, as my ex-colleague John Searle always says, you can't talk about post-industrial angst without language. That's actually true, of course. You, for certain types of thoughts, you need certain words with concepts associated with them that you've uh, picked up over time in order to get certain thoughts. And you sharpen your thoughts, certainly, with language. I'm sure we've all had the experience where you've been writing something. I mean, I think this actually happens in ordinary talk at a, at a very quick uh, very quick pace, but you've had the experience of writing a letter or something, and you've not quite got it right, and you've backtracked and you've changed a word because that captures more what you're interested in, but then you realize you've actually sharpened a thought slightly as well. So there's this very important interplay between uh, thought and language, um, but there's a sense in which we have to understand that Young kids, animals, have thoughts, uh, and they have so without anything approximating a full-blown human language. Language for me definitely is only an approximation, and it's always you know, a reduction of thought. But at the same time, we need that to communicate with others um, what we are thinking. Um, and I see it as, yeah, like, you know, words are, are just like labels, um, and as any labels, it's it's a very thin sliver of whatever we are trying to describe with that word. But when we then put lots of these different labels together in different forms, it can be, you know, sentences, analysis, and in, you know, the case of fiction, of course, stories, um, they build a structure. And that structure is what actually really communicates to the other what we're trying to say. And the stronger the structure becomes like, um, or in a, in a physical shape, the more others can understand what we're saying beyond what can be comprehended with the frontal cortex from those representation that the words are. I mean, what I mean is, if you speak in a very theoretical manner and use just, you know, the words as, as that representation in a, in a theory, others will listen and understand with their uh, consciousness, but might not feel it because there, there is no structure, 
that's a physical structure, it's a theoretical structure.